Thanks everybody, appreciate uh, you taking the time to have us here today. Um, just a quick uh, agenda. Uh, so first we'll um, go through mining safety uh, and we'll get David to present an operator's perspective on mining safety. Uh, we'll then go into doing some language analysis and visualisation. We'll do a bit of a recap. I, I don't know if there's many people left from when I did this uh, last time about four years ago, but uh, I'll do a bit of a recap on what I presented four years ago uh, here. And then we'll look at what we can do uh, with language analysis and safety data. Um, look at what we found at Holson and then we'll give it back to David to wrap up with, as to what it meant, what the uh, analysis process actually mean or has meant to Holson and what they've actually done with it in a practical way. Now, I was going to talk a bit about me, I'm good at that, but um, I don't really need to because uh, Susanna's done a, an excellent introduction. Um, but uh, what I'd like to say is that when most of the first asked me to present here um, and look at our journey in safety when you heard we'd opened our business fusible, um, I looked at it and I said, well, I want to give, I want to give a practical, uh, some practical experience to some of the things that we've done. And uh, unfortunately, I can't really provide that practical experience because I don't really work as an engineer on sites or in construction um, anymore. So I don't have any uh, any um, recent experience in dealing with you know, potentially ha hazardous activities on a day-to-day -day basis. So I got hold of David and asked David to, to come in and present with us. We've been doing quite a bit of work with Wholesome over the last uh, last six months. They've been very good to us. They've allowed us to um, to uh, examine their data, and they've also uh, been very great, uh, very um, grace, uh, graceful in providing us with the opportunities to uh, present their data to everybody as well. So what I'll do, I won't talk anymore. I'll get hand over to David. He can uh, provide uh, a look at his journey uh, in safety. And uh, you know, will you please welcome him? Thank you, Richard. Um, look, I suppose uh, in, a, in a lot of in a lot of cases, um, we've all been we all know about mining. We've all been through mining. Um, what I wanted to do today was just first give a little bit of an overview of uh, who Holson is uh, and what we do, because uh, within the mining and quarrying industry, the quarrying side of the industry is probably a little less known. Um, but nonetheless, very, very similar in, in its application. So first of all, um, who's, who is Holson? Um, they're a multinational company. We operate in 90 countries uh, all around the world, uh, upwards of 115,000 employees, uh, and certainly quite big in Australia. So um, within Australia, you can see there 3,000 people, uh, 60 quarries, 200 concrete plants and 15 precast facilities. So that just gives you a bit of an understanding of the breadth and scope of our organisation uh, around the country. We're very, very diverse, um, which means that while we haven't got a lot of big operations like the BHPs and the Rios of the world, we've got a lot of little ones. Um, and I suppose my journey from, from big miner to, to quarrier uh, when I first transitioned into this uh, this industry, um, originally I thought that uh, how how easy can it be? You know, you've gone from mo uh, managing a mine or, or an organisation that's that's got 3,000 people on site or several hundred people on site to these little quarries. They're going to be easy. But um, uh, in my journey, I found out very quickly that um, those small operations can be very very technical uh, and have just as many problems uh, as some of the big ones. And the interesting thing is is that you don't have just one problem, you have multiple at multiple times around the country. And the photo there is just uh, one example of uh, what one of our quarries might look like. That's uh, up on the Sunshine Coast at Pier Burrum. You can see Mount Tipperagargan in the background. So most of you people have probably seen that or, or been past it at some point in time but didn't even know that existed there. So. Also, a little bit about me. Um, you heard a little bit of my background, uh, the, the technical side. Um, but I think for me these days, the technical side less defines me as opposed to, I guess, some of my experiences along the way. Um, yes, I've, I've been through uni and done all those sort of things, as many of you guys have. But I think um, 
I think really my journey began when I got into the mining industry. So I started in 1994 um, and, and moved through a lot of different uh, sites, different operations uh, from underground to the, the hydrometallurgical processes and the pyrometallurgical processes, being in smelters, uh, both lead, copper, um, as well as working with uranium gold, silver, everything you can name through the BHP journey as well as um, the Extrata, uh, through to these days working with rocks and aggregate that go into our roads and concrete and all those sorts of things. Um, in my bio that um, we heard before, we talked about, uh, it was mentioned at the end, the fatality. Um, I have been through a fatality. I had a, uh, uh, one of my employees killed on the BHP Bill at the Olympic Dam site back in 2008. Um, it's not something I normally talk about uh, when, I, when I speak to groups like this, unless uh, I'm talking about safety. And I suppose for me, that was a real changing point in the safety journey uh, from going from uh, an operator who, you know, sort of knew about safety and um, performed as the company required to actually understanding in, in the worst possible way why safety was important. Um, and, and that really changed the vision that I had and the way I approached a lot of these things. It became a lot more personal to me. Um, and that, that's just a picture of uh, Scott down the bottom. So, so that's 10 years on or 11 years on and I still carry a lot of those scars uh, with me and, and, and do present on that uh, from time to time. So, um, you know, my, my, faith, my focus today, um, it, it used to be just to work hard, uh, do everything I can to, to get ahead, I guess, but um, through all those experiences, three, three really important things uh, sort of resound with me. It's delivering value for the organisation I work for, obviously, but also delivering value to the employees, whether that's their safety, their education, training or advancement and also maintaining a work-life balance. Um, you know, through all this, uh, it, it, uh, I worked out that family was very important uh, in, again, the worst possible way, um, going through a divorce and, and all those sort of things. But um, in reflecting, you know, they're the things that really matter in life and that's how I've sort of changed my perspective over time. So a bit of a perspective as an operator, um, and Richard talked about, you know, the differences between the technical side of, of mining and quarrying and, and, and the, uh, the operational side. So, um, as I said, I started in 1994. Um, and back then, uh, safety in the mining industry was starting to be talked about. And you see there, there's, there's sort of three statements I've got. What is safety? It's nice to be safe. Uh, and then the combination of safety before production or safety is our highest priority and finally safe production. And, and that's sort of four statements that I see of, of sort of uh, define the journey of safety in mining. So before I started, sort of pre-1994 uh, backwards, you could say a lot of operations, especially out west where, you know, there's not a lot of uh, uh, oversight. It was like, what is safety? We'd go, we'd go to work, we'd wear our shorts, we'd, uh, you know, sometimes wear thongs. Uh, maybe no shirt, um, and wouldn't really care. So that, that was, you know, we didn't really know what safety was. And about 90, the, the mid 90s, uh, for me, I saw a change where we started to, to recognise safety. And for me, it started at um, MIM at the time, which has obviously changed names, but it was uh, the year I started, 1994, I think they had five fatalities uh, in, in the space of 12 months. And that's, that really kicked them along to start to think about the safety journey and what they have to do. So we rolled into that. Um, and then a bit later on, we started to talk about safety as our highest priority. I think most of you people have, have probably heard that terminology on the media, probably in the organisation that you guys work in and all those sorts of things. Um, and that's probably where we are today, in my opinion. Um, we, we, still, we still talk about it in the terms of a priority. Now, as we all know, priorities change. And we can end up changing our priorities like that depending on what's happened. So what it says to me, and what it says as far as the growth of safety in our industry, is that, that it's still not quite there. 
um, it's not something we automatically do. So for me, I've sort of used the terminology safe production when I talk about safety these days. And it's about having us culture, the, the safety culturally embedded. And the, probably the easiest way to explain that in, in simple terms is, if we think about it, what's the first thing we do when we hop in a car? The first thing we do is we put our seatbelt on. But do we think about that? Do we have to stop and think and go, geez, what's my priority from a safety perspective before I drive away? We don't do that. We just automatically do that. So that's, that's safe production. So the question for everyone is, is how do we get there? And, and as I said before, it's about developing the right culture, the right behaviours, um, and, and, and giving your, your people, your organisation, the tools and equipment to do that. And in order to get there, we've got to consistently evolve and learn about those sort of things and, and learn from both the good and the bad. So, so many times we see in our, in our industry that you have an accident or an incident and the first thing you do is an investigation, which is fine, and you learn things from that. But as we move down this journey, we have less and less incidents, less and less investigations. So what that means is we've got less and less time to learn or less and less opportunities. So again, in that space, we've got to be thinking about the positives and the proactive side of safety. So not, not what went wrong and how do we learn from it. Yes, we need to do that, but also what went right and how did we learn from that? So that's one of the big things uh, in the industry that I see at the moment uh, as, a, as a massive opportunity. And we're just starting to see that language come into the, the Queensland mining, mining industry at the moment. So through this journey, um, we've seen a lot of work, a lot of improvement. So we've seen in organ organisations that have trended down in their performance in terms of reducing injuries and all that sort of stuff. And it's, it's really good. Um, but th the problem is, is that we are still having fatalities and serious injuries uh, happening in our, in our environment all day, every day. Um, and again, I'm sure some of you will have seen in the media, uh, probably about three or four weeks ago, um, there, was a, there was a big um, mining safety forum called by the, uh, Dr. Anthony Lynham, the Minister for um, uh, Natural Resources, Mines and Energy. And that was around the six, the six fatalities we've had. And if I can, Richard, I might see if I can play that little video. So just to put things into perspective of where we are right now in Queensland. A confirmed man has died in a workplace accident at Fairfield Quarry near Claremont. Connor Mill died after suffering critical head and leg injuries in a machinery accident at Wolfang near Claremont yesterday. The Queensland mine has been shut down after a worker died and 10 others were injured in an underground collision. 47 year old father Bradley Hardwick died after the grader who was driving collided with another. 55 year old Mackay man David Routledge became trapped in an excavator when a high wall collapsed at the open cut mine just before one yesterday afternoon. The construction union warns all Queensland <coughs> small mine sites are shut down following the death of a worker. A man has been killed at a coal mine in central Queensland, the second mining death in two weeks, sparking huge concerns for the safety of workers in the industry. But I think the industry needs to take a step back, have a deep breath and look at where it's going. We need to establish what more could be done. Safety isn't just words, it's actions, it's the top priority. We should look after each other. Look after each other, look after ourselves. Somebody wants you to go home tonight. Mum, dad, wife, kids. Somebody wants you to go home. And it's important to go home safely. So, so we had the, uh, the Ministerial Safety Forum and, and we went through a number of things. Um, you know, 
where the industry is now, what can we do in the immediate term, what does the future and, and the future actions look like, uh, as well as what can government do um, and what can, uh, what does our culture want to look like uh, in the future. So, so all these things are starting to really ramp up and the unfortunate thing is it took six fatalities in six months to get the unions, the operators, the government and the regulators all in the room together. And that was the first time in you know, 25 years of my career, 24 years of my career, that I'd seen that happen. Um, fantastic that it did, but just terrible under the circumstances. So, so what does that lead me to think? It, it basically says that we still need to find better ways to, to do a lot of these sort of things. Um, and, and, and because we're coming down on this journey, what we're seeing is we're getting to a point where we're leveling out. A lot of organisations uh, work really hard on their safety and you see their safety trend go, and I'll, I'll show you ours in a sec, and they come down and they level out. Um, and it's about kick, kicking it along, it's the next step in the journey. Uh, a safety journey is never one that you just start one thing and it solves all the problems. There's, there's stages, there's different levels of cultural development that you go through um, to a point where uh, we use a, a record or a, an indicator called total recordable injury frequency rate. So that's how many recordable injuries that we've had in a million hours of, of million man hours. And that's, that's common across most of the industry. They also talk about lost time injury frequency rate, but for me that's a very important one and I'll, I'll talk a bit about that in a minute. Um, so I've spoken about you know learning from our past experiences, um, whether they be good or bad. But what we need to do is is basically act rather than react to safety, and and this is where some of uh, Richard's work sort of starts to lead into that sort of thing is is getting ahead of game. So this is this is a. Wholesome Aggregates Safety Journey since about 2013. And what I will do is I'll probably start around here. Um, so so this, is a, this is an era for us up to about 2015 before I started uh, in, in the role. Um, and, and it was fair to say when I look back at a lot of this, uh, the, it was very obvious that the organisation was under control uh, we didn't really have a strategy uh, and we didn't really know what we were doing. We had some poor discipline in, in recording some of our incidents and accidents. And as you can see from the data there, it, it sort of jumped around all over the place. Um, I started with the organisation around about this time. Um, very fortunate that the graph goes the, wrong, the right way when I started. But, um, you know, I, I had a look at it and I said, well, okay, we need to be a bit more focused on, on how we operate, how we, how we deal with these sort of things. And, and we had sort of four uh, key things that we really focused on from that point on. It was, it was, it was getting our culture right, which, which sort of the bottom three points sort of covered off on. It's our behaviour and leadership. So I'm a very firm believer in, you know, what interests my boss fascinates me. So by putting a big emphasis and a, and a big interest in, in the safety, the reporting and everything like that, it, it drove a, started to drive the culture in the right way. Uh, the language, using the right language when, when we talk about safety. Sometimes they go everywhere. If you can get people thinking about it, using the right language, using the common language that they understand, then um, that makes a big difference in communicating especially in an organisation like mine where we've got many geographically separated operations um, because the culture on each one of them has to be influenced. And if you can keep it consistent, then, then you can start to influence all or more at once. Uh, and the positive learnings, which I talked about before, very important that you know not only do we learn from the negatives, but we also learn from the positives. And that was a big change for the guys, especially on the, you know, the, the, the shop floor, so to speak, is, thinking in positive terms. What did I do well today or what went well and why did it go well? So with that, we saw a bit of a, a, bit of a change. <coughs> and we travelled on really, really well till about you know, 2018, where um, we had, and you can see some of the numbers there, an AFI, all injury frequency rate, AIFR, at about 20, and a total recordable injury frequency rate below 10. 
So for, for an industry like ours, any, any number in that space below 10 is sort of getting into the top quartile of performances of operations. So you can see there, we started to, to push into that top quartile, um, which was fantastic um, from, from the journey we've gone through. Um, but then what happened? So, so we started to plateau, and this is where I said before, you know, we started to level out. We'd done everything we, well, we thought at the time, we'd done everything we could, we'd, we'd got the culture right, uh, or improve the culture, um, got the guys talking and using the right language and, and reporting and learning and all these sorts of things, but we, we leveled out. So for us it was, you know, we, we even took a little bit of a step up. So for us, it was what, what are the next steps? What do we do different now to, to, to pull us back down and get us on that improvement journey? So for me, I, I was fortunate enough actually through uh, a friend um, to hear about Fusible, and they heard about me, and um, I think at the time uh, uh, Richard was looking for someone to, to get a bit of feedback from industry, and I just happened to, to go and have a coffee with a couple of guys, and um, you know they said, oh, we're, we're interested in your um, opinions on, on this new safety program that we've got, or this new safety software. And I thought, oh, well, I'll go and have a chat. You know, I've seen a million of them. I'm going to go there, and I'm going to tell these guys that yeah, okay, it's all fantastic. It's been done before. Good luck, sort of thing. And um, surprisingly, I sat down with them and uh, you know saw some of their early work um, and thought, my God, this is something that that we haven't seen certainly in our industry before, uh, and certainly a different way of, to approach it. And immediately then I went, Bing, Bing, Bing. You know, there's a, there's a million ways we can use this process in the safety world and, and, other, uh, and other sort of applications through the mining industry. So that led me to, to obviously Richard um, and the, you know, my, my willingness to, to share a lot of our safety data that he could then play with, learn from, and we could sort of go on the journey together. So that's, uh, that's the start up, I guess, of why we're here today or how we got to be here today. And I'll hand back to Richard now and he'll tell you the technical side of how it all works. Thanks David. So it's important to get that context behind you know, what safety really means um, and, uh, and that leads quite nicely uh, into what we do. Sorry. Good work. Yeah. So I'll just run quickly through our model uh, that we use uh, for safety analysis and forgive me I'll, I will read a bit off uh, some slides here because it does I don't want to miss anything. So um, we analyse safety data through the lens of reactive indicators, um, so incidents. Okay. We also look at proactive indicators, so we might look at observations that people take on site on a day-to-day -day basis, look at inspections of hazards. These are all reports that go on while work is being undertaken, and also audits. And then we also look at preventive indicators as well, so job safety analysis, uh, standard operating procedures, and also um, pre-start inspections as well. Things that happen before people should start work. So we want to generate, uh, we want to maximise generation of preventive indicators through the pre-starts, okay? And uh, we want to identify issues before work starts. Now, um, we analyse all of these Okay, and what we really want to do is we want to bring together all these disparate data sets. None of these exist together really. So no one reads all of these things together. Okay, and really it's because there's too much for, for any human to read. So I did a job um, just recently for another mine and they gave us 500,000 observations to work through over so that they generated over three years. Okay, and that was um, you know, a lot of data for us to process. Okay, um, so what we do is we analyse the language in all of these um, documents or, or uh, line items you might find in a database and uh, we look at it to provide a high level picture of the health of our reporting and whether our safety is potentially out of control and we also do things like look at it to see if the risks that are appearing on site actually align with our risk register. That's important because we want to know 
that, um, that the things that we're seeing uh, and the things that, are, that we're paying attention to are the things that we're seeing um, happen on a day to day basis or appear on a day to day basis. Or um, look and see if there's any um, risks or if there's any indicators that show uh, particular risks occurring that uh, you know, we'd need to look at to um, question the, um, the effectiveness of our preventive effort. Okay? If we see that there's some new indicators there or new risks, then we might have to um, have a look at changing our risk register and changing how we do things um, to address those risks and then also change our stra uh, safety strategy or adapt our safety strategy as well. So, we'll go through a bit of revision. Um, so why do we combine text and data visualization? So we do this process, we actually visualize the data. Okay, what we're really interested in is combining or getting all of these hundreds of thousands of observations and incident reports, etc., and trying to put them in one space so we can have a look at them. Okay, there's no point in just trying to read an Excel spreadsheet or a database because you won't be able to make all the connections that you, you want to find between all this data. So um, just here, from now on, we'll be talking about incident data. I won't go into observations or, or any of the other <coughs> data sets that we see. So what we do to construct this visualization you see here on the, on the slide, we, uh, we very quickly apply some syntax processes and lexical analysis to uh, calculate the similarity between inc each incident. So we're looking for a way to compare each incident, uh, uh, every single incident to every other single incident. Okay? And then what we do, we apply a uh, visualization algorithm that takes into account the number and weight of connections related to each node. So each node you see there is a safety incident. Okay? And then uh, we apply a, uh, that visualization algorithm that allows the nodes, that uh, calculates the weight of the, uh, the connections and the number of connections, and it allows the nodes to be located in a two dimensional space. Okay? Now, when you look at this, you see there's all different colors. Um, each different color represents a different categorization of incident that we see in, uh, in the database. So, as I said before, each dot or node represents an incident. Each connection represents a similar language used between incidents or um, incident, uh, incidents with similar language form clusters. Dense clusters, okay, they really pack together. They form, uh, they, they contain <coughs> highly similar incidents. And spread out clusters contain similar incidents, but they're a bit differentiated. So, you might find that a uh, uh, an incident has a uh, might have occurred in a number of different areas across your site. So the, the incidents might be similar, the, but the uh, the location or where it's occurred might be different. Uh, a small distance between connected clusters in, uh, indicate a high number of interrelated incidents, and then a great distance means uh, the opposite, a low number of interrelated incidents. We can pick out uh, in centrally located clusters. Uh, they can show a core concept within the, within the visualization. And peripheral clusters are less central to the ecosystem. And then white spaces you know, give you an idea of what could happen, you know, what, the, what could be out there to happen in the future. So why do we do that? Like I said before, no one can read and make sense of all that text and then apply numerical analysis to it. Okay, and then Visualizing documents as networks or graphs allows us to apply common interpretations around like networks as well. So when I see one of these for safety, after I've sat down for a while and understood what the data or what the, the incidents are actually telling us, then we can actually try, we can actually look at these things and actually make common interpretations when we see a new one. We can go five, uh, we can look at these things very fast and very deep and we can do it uh, very broadly as well. So what can these uh, instant visualizations tell us about safety? Well, here's two examples, okay? Um, they're two completely different data sets. Uh, one, on, one on the right-hand side is from a mine, the other one on the left-hand side is, a, uh, is from an engineering company, okay? And then you can see that uh, the, the visualization on the left-hand side is very tightly bound. A lot of the, um, the nodes are connected to each other, the instants are connected to each other by language. And there's a small number 
of nodes are unconnected to the main body of the um, of the, uh, the main body of the network. Okay, on the right hand side, you see it's a lot different. It's very unconnected. It's very spread out. Okay, and you've got 36 percent of nodes unconnected to the job to the, the giant component or the main body of the network. So we can make some quick interpretations from that. Okay, um, as David said earlier. Uh, we'll look at the left hand side one first. As David said earlier, one of the first things you had to do at Wholesome was to uh, introduce a common safety language. Now, common safety language is really important and um, it, allow, it needs to be uh, specific and widely understood because people on site need to know that they're not misinterpreting instructions when undertaking hazardous tasks. So we need to have a common language. So keep your eyes on task and path. Okay, when you're uh, when you're walking, when you're driving, make sure that you're always looking around you, and we'll come back to eyes on task and path a bit later. So you can see here on the left hand side there, they've actually uh, you can see there's a, a, a pretty common connection between the language. On the right hand side, okay, you've got a lot more spread out, okay, and uh, you've got many more isolated to orphan types of instances that are sitting in the middle there. Okay, so what we can interpret from that is that there's less common language being used to describe your incidents. Um, there's a range, there could be a range of similar incidents that may be occurring across widely different scenarios or widely different incidents occurring across similar scenarios. So, you know, it really, um, it really does make you think that there uh, could be a potential, uh, the safety on this site could be potentially out of control. So, as it did happen, um, the right hand visualisation represented uh, a lack of common language being used on site, okay, and also a high number of different incidents occurring across uh, the whole site as well. And uh, what this review actually resulted in was uh, that site looking at their reporting procedures. We couldn't do much with them at this stage. But we said, look, what we need is a much better data set for you to come back with. And one of the first things you probably need to do is pay attention to how you're actually reporting um, your, your incident data and what language you're using. So now what they're doing is they're going, uh, every single incident or observation that they, uh, they undertake, um, uh, each incident now goes and is submitted for review and approval by a key person, and then they look at the language, and then they, um, with the, the people affected by that um, by that incident, they work through and make sure that it's presented in a way that can be uh, utilised later on. So, if we look at Holson's incident data, um, this is uh, a network constructed from their incidents. Um, uh, in 2018-2019. So it shows you know, a well-connected network, a lot of similar language being used across the business. Um, and our, uh, that's our first interpretation, is that they're, they're doing very well with their language. Um, the clusters are tightly bound, indicating high degrees of similarity with the language. Um, there are some anomalies here. Sorry, that doesn't matter. So you see the uh, those two incident circle, or those two uh, clusters circle at the top there. They represent pre-start um, pre-start activities or pre-start inspections, and also safe activity observations. Now, different language is uh, is used to describe pre-starts and uh, safe activity observations. And so that's why they're actually separated themselves from the from the, uh, the main body of the network. Now, if I had my timing, I probably wouldn't um, you have included those inside of the network, and I would have left them out. But it does show that the, uh, the system's actually working. The language is different, so they do separate. Now, um, if we just look at the next bit here, uh, two other clusters. So I just wanted to show you quickly how some clusters relate to each other. So if we look at uh, clusters 12 and 14, what you see is that um, cluster 12 there is related to stop, stop signs assessing the area. So it's around signage, uh, cars stopping when they go through, when they approach stop signs. 
Okay, and number 14 is issues with hold point signs, uh, flat tyres and trailers. But they're talking about signs, again, not totally related, but they're closely related inside the network. It does show you that there's some similarities occurring between those. Now, um, if you have a look here, we also utilise some of the other data that we find inside of the safety database. So how we can use these, um, these visualisations is when we've used the language to construct them, then all the associated data with those incidents can actually be used to conditionally format or I'll filter the, um, the, uh, the network to actually provide us with indications of other things that are going on. So, we looked at uh, the ratings of proactive versus reactive incidents. And so what we've got here, we've got all incidents on the left hand side and then we've just filtered it to the, uh, to the reactive incidents on the right hand side. What we found is little clusters that we're, in we're interested in um, right up front. So, first one up the top there is not stopping at stop signs or disobeying signs. The next one uh, down below that is vehicle visibility. And the one below that is wearing appropriate PPE and clothing. So that gives us an opportunity to really focus in on a couple of reactive areas very, very quickly. Okay, so let's have a look at vehicle visibility. So the <coughs> vehicle visibility issues that we saw from the reactive um, incidents just previously, they're mostly contained in cluster number seven. So there's a couple of incidents we've uh, described there. Um, employees driving their vehicles into the quarry, uh, the personal cars, they've got no flashing lights, no flags, no communication uh, for driving into, it, into the quarries. Or another one is a Weybridge operator has uh, observed contractors driving out past the Weybridge with no vehicles and flashing lights. So visibility of vehicles on site is really important. Things like flashing lights, flags, um, reverse, audible reversing alarms, horns, uh, radio communication, we need to have those things working perfectly so people can understand where, are, where we are. Okay, if we don't have those things, there's going to be an accident, especially with large, um, heavy vehicles uh, rolling around. So, when we look at cluster number seven there, we look at a lot of the, uh, uh, on, and look at the proactive versus reactive incidents in that cluster, we find that you know, a lot of these things are being identified proactively. Okay, so when someone sees that, uh, that uh, someone on site is not doing the right thing, they're actually raising and putting an incident report in. Okay, 8% uh, of those are, are reactive. But what we're really interested in there is that these observations shouldn't actually be happening. There's things that we should be picking up early in our pre-starts. Okay, so before a truck or a car starts working on site, the pre-start should be, um, should be uh, undertaken uh, properly and effectively. Okay, and uh, we looked at pre-starts just there. So when we looked at those, we said around 20% of those uh, observations really could be um, described as occurring during a pre-start. Okay, the rest are during operation. When we talked about conditional formatting of the, uh, the incidents uh, or, or of these networks earlier, um, we can also look at risk. Okay, so every time uh, an incident is uh, reviewed or, or an incident happens on site, we do a risk assessment. People involved do an initial risk assessment. Okay, and then once that initial, once the incident has been reviewed, um, we're uh, we're interested of the, uh, the incident's then reviewed by the site safety team. Okay, and the site safety team probably then takes into account things like the potential consequence. Of, of incidents on site, okay? The initial risk review often, often doesn't. So what we're really looking for is looking for a change in the initial risk assessment versus the revised risk assessment. Now if you look at that, um, you'll see that both of those diagrams there probably haven't changed very much at all. So that's a very quick indicator for us that there might be a potential problem on, on, the, uh, on the sites. The uh, revised risk assessment doesn't seem to have changed. We're not taking into account potential consequences, so we can't be learning from these incidents. Now, when we brought this up with Hobson, uh, what we found was that, yes, the revised risk assessment was being done, but the data wasn't being captured back in the database. So we detected a potential hole in the, um, in the, in the system, and now that's, uh, that's now being rectified um, as we speak.
okay, but there's another question we've got to ask ourselves um, just here. Um, we weren't able here to use a risk assessment to uh, identify uh, potential areas of high risk or clusters of high risk because the, the data wasn't there for the two mapings to be able to do it. Uh, a previous project uh, that I've worked on, um, there was a, 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 we did the same type of assessment and we found a pocket of high risk incidents uh, occurring on a regular basis year to year through these diagrams. Very similar uh, instances across the, the mine sites that we were looking at. And they were basically looking at um, uh, problems with vehicles in motion and people not looking where they're going, where they're driving, and not communicating properly. We were able to pick that up very quickly with this, just like pinpointing that there was um, a whole series of uh, incidents occurring year on year, and a similar number of them. So we couldn't use this uh, assessment to help us guide us where we think there might be uh, uh, some uh, potential issues. So we then started to look at how do we use language? Um, how do we use our language even more to do that? We can't use a risk assessment, but we can use language. So we apply this risk formula, risk equals hazards plus behaviours. Okay, now hazards are pretty much generally fixed. So we've got hazards there, biological, chemical, electrical, gravitational, mechanical, motion, pressure, radiation, sound, temperature. Those are all things that you would all understand in your day-to-day -day work if you're in the lab here or if you're working on site, you understand all the roads. Okay, but then we've got the behaviours. Okay, and behaviours are, are, are people behaviours. So the way we do things changes on a day-to-day -day basis. How we're feeling? Are we distracted? You know, do we um, do we uh, are we doing things uh, the same way every time we do a task? So behaviours that we look at are access and egress. Um, do we have the right barricading? Uh, are we looking where we're going? Eyes on path and task. Um, our housekeeping, uh, isolation procedures. Are we isolating equipment properly when we're working on it? Job planning, have we planned properly? Are we putting ourselves in the line of fire of uh, equipment or materials moving around um, the, the plant or the machinery that we're working around? Uh, manual handling. A typical one, uh, our use of uh, protective personal equipment or personal protective equipment, and then the tools that we're selecting to do our work, the jobs that we do. So, we've developed dictionaries um, for each hazard and behaviour in these lists. So, we go through, we've done a lot of work over the last 12 months, reading you know, hundreds of thousands of incidents and finding and correlating language that actually describes those instances. We've built up dictionaries that allow us to um, define, um, or you, with language that allows us to define what those hazards and behaviours actually are. Um, now, usually natural language processing, when you're using uh, natural language processing, and what we've done to construct these, um, these visualisations, they basically use generic data sets to enable us to, uh, to calculate similarities and use language. But what it doesn't take into account is that different indus industries have specialised language. Okay? So language that's not covered by the generic data sets. So this is why we've uh, basically uh, developed language for safety and develop developing dictionaries, etc., for safety right now. So what we do here is then we analyse each incident and we look for uh, key words and phrases and combinations of key words and phrases to, um, to allow us to identify combinations of hazards and behaviours um, to see where uh, we, we might have potential for um, serious incidents. So if you look on the, uh, the right hand side you'll see the hazards and in particular we've got issues with motion um, on the Holston sites and potential gravity problems as well. So gravity might be rocks falling from trucks. Uh, it might be people falling from ladders. It might be, um, oh, it could be any number of things where people fall down or something falls from, another, uh, from a uh, platform or from a conveyor or from a truck. And we look at behaviours. But particular, um, I'm look at these three in particular, we've got job planning behaviours that we see which um, it could be a positive. You could have the, the incidents could be showing very good job planning behaviours before uh, 
during normal work. Um, we've got uh, uh, housekeeping, which is a general one where you see uh, material or equipment left lying around uh, for, for this trip hazards. And then we've also got our eyes on part from task. We don't look at these three um, particular uh, combinations, job planning and gravity, um, job planning and motion, and also eyes on task and pass and motion. Now, it's important to remember that when we go through this, we shouldn't just be looking for the negative, but we should also be looking for positive um, things as well that people are doing right on site. And so I just wanted to bring up um, you know, this area of good practice uh, on Holson sites where we're looking at uh, uh, intersections of uh, gravity and job planning and it's really working around um, high walls uh, where you've got overhanging, uh, large rocks overhanging work areas or drill bench areas or where there's been issues that may have been seen with face and wall stability and overhanging rocks. So what we've got, uh, we've got our initial uh, network and then we've basically filtered that to the, uh, those incidents that show um, gravity, uh, uh, gravity hazards and job planning behaviours. Okay. Another uh, set of incidents there that we've, uh, we've shown, and you can see there we've, uh, we've looked at whether they're proactive, reactive or preventive. And what we're seeing here is that, um, that there's a very, we haven't seen any reactive um, incidents, which is great, we don't want rocks falling down and, and hitting vehicles or, or coming near people. We've seen very proactive practices and very preventive practices occurring at uh, on Holston sites. So, um, for example, uh, inspections are being conducted before anybody works using an excavator around the high wall. They're looking for unstable rocks. They're looking for, for things that might fall and might hit our vehicles and might cause um, uh, damage to equipment or harm to people. Okay, and then also in a proactive way. People are very vigilant while they're working around these areas. So if there's any um, if there's any indication that there may be a problem with an overhanging rock or um, a facial wall stability, then our uh, uh, people are reporting in a proactive manner and they're rectifying the situation as soon as they can. I'll also say, sorry. Another area that we found some, uh, some good proactive behaviour um, was particularly around rain events on Holston sites. So um, every time there's a large rain event, the storm uh, goes around the area. Um, Holston personnel are very, very proactive in identifying things like washouts, potholes, etc., etc. There's always inspections that go on um, after a rain event to make sure that the, um, the area is safe for people to work in after, um, after the, the event's finished. Next thing we look at, I think we're actually running uh, quite short of time there. Are we okay to keep? Yeah, we'll keep on moving on. I'll actually just, um, I'll go to this one. Uh, motion and uh, eyes on path and task. So uh, a few things we're looking at there. So um, watching where you're going, where you're driving pretty much is the, the, the implication of this combination of, uh, of uh, uh, hazards and behaviours. Um, so intersections of motion, uh, of intersection of these two hazards or this hazard and this behaviour are essentially uh, they're manifesting in disobeying road rules on site, poor signage or blind spots uh, as well. So it's not hard to imagine the potential for a significant incident should someone drive through a stop sign in front of a heavy vehicle. So it's really important. We need to make sure that people that you know, vehicles are stopping, they're looking, people are looking where they're going and keeping their eyes you know, on the, the other vehicles, etc., uh, around them. So, these are mainly found in, in cluster 12. Okay, so we isolate cluster 12 and we look down uh, at the bottom there where we've um, expanded out to cluster 12 now, and we see that we've got a number of, uh, about 65% of the incidents that we see are related to signage in that cluster. We've got 21% uh, of the incidents related to eyes on path, so people not looking where they're going. And then we've also identified a number of blind spots um, as well. So 
these are all related to each other. So we can see the language system is actually working, or stops on for blind spots and people not looking where they're going. Those incidents are related to each other. Um, so, uh, you know, the system's picking up what we need to pick it up. Okay, I'll just quickly hand over to David again, um, so he can tell you what this actually means to Holson. Thanks, Richard. Um, so for me, when I first saw that, it was a lot of dots on the paper. <laughs> it's really, really interesting, but, but very quickly you pick up the concept of, of what Richard's talking about. And I think, um, as I said, you know, when we, when we originally started talking about it, the concept of what Richard was trying to do was, was very obvious. It was a different way to learn from our data, very fast, very efficient, especially when you're talking about tens of thousands of records, um, and, and, and presented an opportunity to break through that, that levelling out of our safety journey. Um, but I think, I think for me, and, and probably Richard, we went through a bit of a journey of actually learning what the technology was telling us. And, and I think um, you know, a couple of things that we, we talked about along the way was the, the different data. Uh, and Richard, Richard talked about the, the, all the different bits of data coming together. Um, we had to be careful that when it all came together, that it just didn't spit out one answer and you know tell us one thing that was actually not really happening or or what we originally thought was that everything that it was telling us was was incorrect and it took a bit of uh, thinking about how it worked to, to work out that we had positives and negatives coming out through this process and it was important to be able to pick those and understand those and and uh, we went through that sort of sort of journey uh, and, and hence we got to that point where we had strengths and opportunities and Obviously, Richard talked about a few of our strengths and a, and a few of our opportunities. But I think, um, you know, for me, what it really gave my business was just the speed at which it could interrogate that data. If I was to ask someone to look through, I think we had 30,000 records all yeah. round about. Yeah, 30,000 records that we looked at. If I, if I asked someone to go back over two years, three years, four years, five years, look at all those records and try and interpret, you know, similarities between them, they'd probably be still sitting here now, you know, six months later. Um, and, and the other big thing for me was around the correlation of hazards with behaviours. You know, uh, Richard talked about the little uh, pyramid graph, or whatever you want to call it over there, that, that sort of highlighted different areas. And when we looked at those, it was really interesting to say, okay, which ones do we now want to drill into deeper? So there's a level, there's a couple of levels of interrogation you can go through, and you can look at the sort of high level and say, alrighty, oh, that's a good thing. We probably don't need to look too much more into that. But hey, that's something for me that's unusual. Let's drill into that and understand a lot, a lot more about it. Um, so, so that was certainly something different uh, for us, and and I suppose. The findings and the next steps, where, where does Holson go with this going forward? Um, so for, first of all, you know, we talked about the geotechnical and common language positives that, that it identified, which was really pleasing for me to know that, that you know, what I was intuitively seeing in the way that people operate was actually coming through in the data. So it sort of um, you know, gave, me, gave me a good feeling about that. And the geotechnical awareness, um, as you can imagine, working in quarries, uh, you've got a lot of you know, geotechnical hazards that you're dealing with and it's always pleasing to know that A, you know, we're getting to them before they become uh, incidents and B, that our people are, are very much aware of those and reporting them so that we can rectify them uh, through, through normal operation. Uh, the opportunities that came for us, uh, Richard talked about the differences between the risks uh, before and after we'd, we'd investigated an event. Um, that was one that you know, I really wasn't aware of at the time. Um, you know, it just shows, I suppose, that we weren't going back into the system, A, updating it, but B, really having a look at some of those, you know, some of those actions and, and outcomes of those investigations. So that's an area that we're working on, I suppose. Um, and the other one that, that Richard talked about a little bit here, and there were, there were several others, but one of the big ones was around vehicle visibility uh, at our sites. Um, now, again, you go to any mine site, you go out, you, you look around and you go, wow, there's a lot of big equipment running around. Um, yeah, it's important we, we are aware of it. Um, and, and that's about as far as most of us go. You know, what, we, we need a traffic management plan, we need to da-da-da, all these sort of things. But 
again, what we were able to do with this process was drill down and understand where in that process we were having issues. And, and for us, you know, as, as Richard said, it was about four key things for me. Um, ineffective pre-starts and inspections, make sure that you know, our vehicles and our people are right to go out to work before they get out there. It was about intersection design uh, and signage. So we had a lot of, uh, you know, there was a lot of language that was picked up in there around the intersection design, the signs, either A, not being in the right place or location, or being hard to see. Um, and for us, as operators that work in Macquarie every day, we, we sort of learn the streets, as anyone does in their local neighbourhood, but you put a, a visitor in there, a contractor, and they rely very hef heavily on being able to see everywhere, be able to read the signs and get directions from them. So for us, that was a, a very important one. And, and then finally, um, you know, some ineffective contract entry processes. Again, while we manage, while we're managing our own people and our own vehicles on site, we were letting a lot of our contractors slip through uh, with their vehicles um, and, and how they were set up. So they were probably four big things for us that, you know, really presented an opportunity to do something differently. So we're in the process now of, of working through those. Um, and I suppose, you know, really where are those next steps? Uh, Richard and I will continue to work together to look at a few of those things, but um, I, I, feel, I feel that, uh, you know, this sort of technology has led us in a couple of directions that I wouldn't inherently have gone looking for or the organisation wouldn't have gone looking for without some of this you know, further interrogation. So um, yeah, it's certainly been a, a very big learning exercise for us um, and something that's been very, very interesting. And I thank Richard for sort of you know, using me as a bit of a guinea pig. I'm sure, uh, I'm sure it'll go a lot further in the future. So, from me, um, thank you. I uh, appreciate your time. I, I don't know that we ran a little bit over, but um, uh, yeah, really uh, enjoyed the experience of being able to get up here and talk a little bit about some of this. That's it for me. Thanks very much.